Sue Kelly. I'm going to moderate this session. And uh, welcome to a small select audience. Uh, and obviously, it's going to be streamed to millions. So you're the, you're the, the, the live witnesses of something that, um, in true podcast tradition, will just spread and spread and spread. And uh, we, we, us early risers this morning, I, I would imagine that we're, we're used to it for lots of different reasons. But one would be, you know, news, actually. Uh, so we're going to spend an hour with you talking about the, the kind of relevance of news, whose news we're talking about, the right to do the news, and um, anything else that's on your mind. I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves as they would define themselves. And, you know, in this festival of women and non-binary people, obviously we've all got both kind of personal stories and professional stories, and I personally like to link them both because I'm not sure there is a separation between work and life. That's never been my experience. Um, so I'm Jude Kelly. I founded the WOW Women of the World Festival 12 years ago, which is now in many countries. And, and I've done two podcasts so far. Um, podcasts weren't around when I was a little girl or even, you know, an older woman. Um, and, um, but the reason I started the WOW Festivals was because as a woman, I felt so frustrated with the idea that the, the story of women and non-binary people was sort of contained into and also, and also, so that in a way by talking about it as a, as a kind of something that is particular to a group of people, you were separating women's stories from the center of humanity. And you were saying these are stories about some particular people, but they don't represent everybody. Whereas somehow that meant that men's stories did. And the, the, I think the thing that most alarmed me once was going to Somaliland where we did a wow and going to see the caves where some of the oldest cave paintings are and talking to the curator, the male curator, about the fact that it wasn't as exciting that the, that the women and girls would have been doing these paintings. And he was totally adamant that it was impossible that women would have done them. And when you said, well, why? And he said, well, because they didn't. And that was the fact. So... I felt, you know, in starting as a theatre director, everything to do with WOW, what I've really been trying to do is make it possible for women's stories, girls and women's stories, to be told in the way that they wanted to tell them, celebratory as well as full of different kinds of feelings and emotions and make those stories visible. So that's me. I'm not a podcast expert, but, I, I've, but WOW, I've had two podcasts so far, and the wonderful Imriel, who founded this festival, was the producer of the second lot. So over to you, describe yourself and what you're up to. <laughs> of course. Um, so my name's Ellie Clifford. Um, I describe myself as a podcast producer. Um, so I got my start doing a really big mix of stuff from documentaries for Radio 4 um, to podcasts for places like The Economist and Politico. Um, I really enjoy podcasting and the medium, and I think it lends itself really nicely to news. I've always been absolutely obsessed with the news. I'm the person who rolls out of bed and immediately is checking what's happened on Twitter in the you know, five hours that I haven't been awake to read it. Um, and so I think what I really love about it and why I'm really proud to be a news podcaster is I think that there is a lot of men in that section of the industry. And actually, I do feel really proud when I feel like I'm producing something that I'm a woman that's doing. It. And I think it's really, you know, things like today, I think are great for carving out space for people who maybe, you know, wouldn't fit the traditional bill of who would be a podcast producer in the new space um, to come and like share ideas, listen to it, and figure out that actually, yeah, you can do it as well. And you ha have worked in the sort of traditional news spaces, would you say? I mean, obviously, they're reaching out to do more things, but... Yeah, so it's interesting. So I've worked for lots of big, like, traditional news companies, but I've done it through independent production companies, so I've never been officially in the building, which I think is quite nice for me because I think it does allow me some space to kind of think differently about what I'm doing because I kind of come into these organisations. Um, but, yeah, certainly I think you can really see that big traditional broadcasters are seeing that there's a lot of space in podcasting to do some really interesting things and they're turning to it more. And those are the kind of programmes that I often end up making where you might have, you know, The Economist, for example, which, you know, focuses on the paper but actually really realises that they're getting through to an audience via their podcasts and sees that it's much more important than maybe they first thought. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll come back to that idea of, you know, how they use podcasts and what, they, what the boundaries might be about that. So, over to you. Uh, you've also had a long period of doing this work now. Yeah, so I'm Rasheen Iqbal. Um, I would primarily define myself as a journalist. Um, 
I also host the Guardians Today in Focus podcast um, as of last year. Um, and yeah, it's been a real baptism of fire there because I've worked in print for about 15 plus years, mostly with the Guardian, the Observer. Um, in one of my other incarnations of many jobs I've had, I was actually a radio and podcast critic for the Guardian. Um, so I was aware when the industry started changing, I just didn't expect necessarily to be, at, well, very much part of it um, in a daily news show, essentially, uh, which is, I feel, as, as intense as you can get with podcasting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically me. So do, 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 were you sort of flipped into doing this or did you kind of go, there's a lion's den over there, I really want to go into it and find out what it's like? I, uh, I got asked to do a pilot and uh, then I got asked to do another one. I just didn't take it very seriously and I think when you're, when, when you have, you know, you're totally invested in something, I think this is really what I want to do. Well, for me anyway, I would have, well, I would have done that. I would have fluffed it a bit, but um, because I didn't necessarily think, I didn't have a plan. I actually, I've, I've messed up the mic, guys. Um, I didn't have a plan that this is what I was going to do, so I... Yeah, it, it, it meant that I came across as someone who was pretty confident and able to do it. <laughs> okay. That's the trick. Pretend you, pretend you don't care. Okay, so we'll come back to that idea of, um, if you like, the right to do things. Um, is your mic okay? I'm just clipping it back in. Excellent. There's somebody coming on stage now to Thanks, fiddle sorry. with you. I wave my hands too much. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you've done well. There you go. Thanks. Brilliant. Okay, so in a sense, you're the, you're the outlier, aren't you, in all of this? Yes, perhaps. Uh, I'm Gemma Ware. I, I would also, I guess, describe myself as a journalist, um, but I currently co-produce and co-host and do kind of everything on a, uh, a podcast for an organisation organization called The Conversation, which is a charity, uh, like a news charity, which is, its mission is to kind of get knowledge and expertise from academia out to the general public. Um, so we work, we, we, we're a news organisation, but our kind of bread and butter is uh, expertise in academics. So it's quite a different approach to kind of um, the news. Uh, so it's, yeah, it comes from kind of deep expertise. Um, my background is in print. Um, uh, I've worked, um, yeah, mainly as a print journalist. Um, and I, uh, when I, when I kind of was working as an editor for the conversation and then I, my, my kind of, my passion is audio and I listen and that's how I consume and that's where things stick in my brain and I felt it was definitely the right time to explore that and so just worked and kind of drove a few different projects in the conversation and have kind of gone from doing it kind of at six o'clock in the evening as a kind of a thing that uh, they let me do as a, as a trial to making it my full-time job so um, that's that, now you do it all the time day and night yes yeah, yeah day and night <laughs> yes indeed and the weekends yeah yeah and the weekends um, <laughs> so Let's just talk a bit about the notion of news, because um, the idea of news being absolutely current, immediate, I mean, there are hundreds of news channels, established news channels, but just in your case, for example, conversations, you must feel as if there is something that those news channels don't convey or don't convey in depth or don't convey in, a, in the way that you think the story should be told. Is that right? I mean, how do you make a decision between saying, well, you know, this is all being told already, here's my niche? Yeah, I mean, I think that is something that the conversation does stand apart from, and that was why it was created, and, and its founders' ideas was that, idea was that sometimes journalists are asked to kind of switch their brains onto a story kind of 12 hours before, and, and they don't have that deep expertise on an, on, on an area. Um, whereas academics have been studying, done PhDs and kind of studying this issue for, for, for years and are really often not great at communicating that. I was going to say, I'm, I'm in yeah. total awe of what the conversation does because we only occasionally interview academics and it is hard work getting them to tell a story in the way that journalists sort of want and are able to convey. Yeah, I think the conversation has actually done a lot since its, its founding about a decade ago, first in Australia and now it's moved globally um, in kind of changing the hopefully changing what academics feel their role in society is mm -hmm. and they should be sharing their information um, but as a, a, your question about being kind of we're a little bit of an outsider and we, I guess that is our niche and I think that is something that is important for a news podcast to kind of see where they 
where they stand out. And that, obviously that's what we can do. We can bring that deep knowledge, you know, someone who's kind of been to a place long before it was in the news and has been talking to the people who live there and, or has been, you know, understanding the in, intricate details of a phys you know, physics experiment or something. Um, and then they can, they can convey why this moment of this news story is important, you know. Mm. And do you act, uh, because, you're, because you're a journalist, and because therefore you know the need to shape a story in a particular way, that to give it some immediacy, to give it some vividness, etc. Are you also part of the idea of I suppose, coaching or um, like getting academics to rethink the relationship they have with public communication? Is that part of what? I mean, you're that doing? is basically the conversations kind of remit. That is remit. Um, right. in, in audio, it's 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 kind of difficult because you can prep someone as much as you like, but then when you ask them the questions, they might, and I'm sure all of you feel this, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not always, it doesn't always go the way you plan. Um, and particularly with an academic who isn't a journalist, because if you were interviewing another journalist, and obviously that's what a lot of other podcasts do, they interview journalists from within their yeah. stable. We don't, so we can't always rely on them to do the things we ask them to do. Um, so that obviously means more questions, more editing. Um, yeah. It's a bit of an extra extra workload. I mean, WOW is doing a, a shared programme at the moment with Birkbeck called Shameless, which is based, which is about everything to do with sexual violence and medical uh, encounter. And that project, Shame at Birkbeck, is a whole group of uh, academics who are studying the whole history of sexual violence um, in all its ways. And we've done a festival that sort of brings all that academic conversation in with, if you like, public communication. We did it in London in November, and we're doing it in Rio uh, in September. And the, the, this idea of translating deep knowledge into public uh, communication, it, it seems like an incredibly important thing to do. Because otherwise, with all due respect, sort of journalists and editors of news say, well, it, in a way, if, if it's not, uh, palatable, easily palatable and quick, then you know, it, it, can't be, it can't be relevant. Mm. So in a sense, this idea of training people, not just academics, but local community leaders, whoever, to kind of realise their, how their story needs to be told seems very, very important. But coming back to you, because you just immediately said that, oh God, these academics, they drive you mad. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, that's, it's always hard work. Obviously, you really respect their deep knowledge, and, but trying to get them to share their passion in a way that you know, a lay person will understand doesn't often come naturally, mm. as you know. No. But yeah, it's... Uh, so but it's also interesting thinking about your audience, because so particularly when I was working on things like Babbage and Money Talks for The Economist, you might have someone who was an expert in their field and you needed to make it palatable, but you also didn't want to feel like you were talking down to your audience. You need yeah. to think about what knowledge do they have um, and kind of build your questions around that and kind of, you know, pull that out of your academic so that it's understandable, but equally people don't turn off because they think, why well, are you talking to me as if I don't know what any of this is? Yes, yeah, so finding the t kind of the tone of voice mm. between expertise and, and, and kind of lively communication. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and is that what you would say as a producer you're trying to do. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I always feel that the presenter often has so much that they have to do in that conversation that actually your job as a producer is really important to listen to what's going on. Like, yeah, you're having to keep an eye on the time and keep it moving, but you also need to think about the content. Will someone understand this? And actually, you know, you're there to help the presenter if maybe they haven't asked that follow-up question that's going to help you stitch it all together. And I feel like it's a really important thing as a producer. And the more you do it, I think the more you hear it. But you eventually start to hear what's going to cause you an issue in the edit, so you can see how you're creating problems for your future self. Uh, and I think it's really important to remember that when you're in the booth, because once you're out and that interview is over, unfortunately, you know, you can do some work around scripting, but that's it, the, you know, the person's gone off to the rest of their day. Um, and so, yeah, you really need to be thinking about, does this story make sense once I kind of cut it down, streamline it, streamline it edit it? Will they understand actually what's happening? Okay, so just staying on that idea, which is that you're trying to do, make the, the story as rich and accessible as possible, and you have a whole range of you know, expert witnesses in different ways, with, with through lived experience or research or whatever. A bit like a, a, a director in a film, like if it's not in the editing suite, it's not available. Um, you then presumably have to have a very wide sense of what the story might contain the nuances that maybe haven't reached the surface yet or you know to me how wide yeah. do you feel you have to go in order to have the material just in case the story changes 
or you, you see it suddenly from a different angle? Yeah, I think you definitely need to think about that. You don't want to ask every single question so actually it becomes a really woolly interview, but I do think that you need to think about, okay, you know, particularly if you're doing a podcast where you might be talking to lots of different people, you need to think about what can I get this person to say that actually will be really interesting because I know I'm going to talk to that person about it and trying to think of that thread, not thinking about them in isolation. And with news, you have to do it very, very quickly because uh, you've got to kind of stay timely with the story. So I think um, that is a really big part. That's why researching is such an important part and you know, to be strong at research is such a great skill to have as a podcast producer in news. I know it will be as a journalist in general, but you just really need to be able to kind of get a great sense of the landscape. What actually is the story? Why is this important? And what do you need to ask? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that, this idea that the, the research search underneath the story means that you have this flexibility to tell the story from a number of different directions. How, you know, if you think about The Guardian, I mean, pa papers and, of course, The Economy, they, they, they have their positions, mm. you know, they, they have the thing, the thing that what they stand for. And so do you ever find that there's a conflict? I mean, this is true with a podcast or anything else, but in a sense, the liquidity of a podcast, the ability to kind of roam quite wide. When you feel a story is not told in the right way or people want it to push it that way, but you actually feel it should be dragged the other way, What's, what are the tensions involved then of making a podcast when you're not an independent voice? Well, it's quite funny with Today in Focus because we're actually supposed to be even more neutral than the rest of the paper because a lot of our audience don't actually read The Guardian. And I'll give you one example where we did this Johnny Depp and Amber Heard episode the other week and we'd interviewed one of our columnists who had a very particular take. Um, and then when we edited it down, we realised... And the lawyers also pointed out, mm, are we sure that we're not going to, we need a bit more on the other side, we need a bit more, well, it's supposed to be balanced anyway, but we really, really try not to take just, you know, this is the Guardian view on something. Um, like even our editorial on the case was more Guardian, let's say, than the podcast was, because we recognise that actually our audience aren't, you know, traditional Guardian readers are coming to it as a news podcast, as they would come to the BBC. So that's, yeah, generally the, the balance we're trying to strike. Less editorialising is what I'm saying. Less editorial. OK, so I'm, I'm, I'm obviously interested in the idea of neutral as a phrase at all. I mean, <laughs> what is neutrality? Yeah, well, I exactly. Mean, oh, it's what is impossible, it? but um, in, in as much as you feel you can tell a story fairly and you're doing, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a service rather than an opinion. That it's, it's, it's information rather than... Uh, you know, completely, you know, opining. Yeah, okay, so it's, it's not like this is me and I'm having a chat with you about what I feel. It's not, it's not talk podcasts. No, I think our producers wish I would do more of that, but um, <laughs> no, it's not. I, 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 I keep myself very much out of the podcast so far. Because mm -hmm. it's, it, I, it's, I mean, as much as I'm a host, it's not really about my personality, it's about the stories that we're telling. Yeah, but... but and, but thinking about, obviously, you know, a producer has kind of editorial control. As a presenter, do you have editorial control? Where would you say the editorial control exists? Uh, where does it exist? Ultimately, I would say with the executive producer, but it's really, we have a very collaborative team. Like, we'll, you'd be surprised, or I was surprised when I started working on it, how much of the episode we've actually planned out before doing any of the interview. Like, it's so structured. We know exactly which points we need to hear and what needs to come where, just as you said, so it makes producer's job much easier in the edit. And obviously your interviewees can take things in sort of wild tangents and stuff and you've got to be able to very nimbly, very quickly either follow that if it's a good thread or rein it in. Okay, so the, the, one of the things I think is an, also an interesting tension about people's stories generally is that you might have a, you know, a journalistic... Uh, invitation and the and in a way as you just described they've already kind of decided what the story is and how it will be told this is not a criticism i'm mm. just saying that this is yeah, a sort yeah. of you know often the feeling is and then the person coming into that will go well i feel you're slotting me into something whereas actually the way i would tell the story is this to which i suppose you could say well go and do your own podcast then but 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 actually the kind of the sense of using people to tell the story which has been pre-devised puts a lot of responsibility on all of you, doesn't it? On all of us, in a way to, 
to really search through our own biases, our own attitudes. You know, you can't just like take the stuff off the shelf. So do you, have you ever done a, a, a podcast and then thought, I didn't really know the whole story and it was only when I interviewed that I understood something else and it was too late because I couldn't kind of, mm. I, I couldn't edit it back in again. I think I'm a bit of a control freak. I bet you have that more, don't you? Yeah, sometimes the academics, we do pre-interview them, but then, you know, in the interview, they might come up with this amazing side story that, you know, how they did something. Like, okay, well, we didn't plan that, but we'll, then the whole thing shifts around. Um, but I do think it's different where, so say in Today in Focus, for example, you often interview kind of somebody who's at the heart of a story, like a, a regular person, mm. plus you'll also then interview the journalist. And I think clearly you can plan that the journalistic part of that interview much more than you can yeah. For the for the yeah. kind of the, the the person in the story, um, although you can still plan that, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Um, you, you don't really know where they're going to take you, do you? Yeah. No. And in terms of expertise, I don't know. Like coming from like quite a, a hardcore print background, like I felt like I, when I was doing when I was first presenting, I was obsessed with uh, like knowing everything, doing all the research, and then when I'd go in and do the questions, the execs would be like. No, 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 roll it back. You've got to do it really simply. I was like, yeah, but I already know this. I know this information. It's like, the listeners don't care. You're the proxy for the listener. They want it explained. And it took me a while to realise, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm here to, to, to be the lay person. You know, I'm not that I'm an expert in anything. But, um, yeah, and so learning that process, sort of mm -hmm. letting go of it and trusting your voices to do the work. I think for me, like part of the reason that I love podcasting is that it does lend itself to flexibility. You know, things like if you have like the 1 p.m. news or the 6 p.m. news, people know what that format looks like. It's part of their daily routine. It's at a very set time. They know what they want to expect and what they want to get out of it. Whereas a podcast is something that you might listen to at different times of the day. So I think, you know, if you're listening to a podcast and yeah, it has a usual format, but actually you start an episode and they're like, do you know what, we're going to do it differently this week because we interviewed this person, they were amazing and we're just going to run it long and we can do that. And normally the podcast is 45 minutes, but it's an hour this week, enjoy. You can do that and I think that's what's great. And on Politico, that's one thing that I really admired about my presenter, Jack, because that was very collaborative between the two of us and he was like a real powerhouse in that podcast. And he was really great at just being like, do you know what? Yeah, actually, we've, we were planning to do this, but we've interviewed these people, and actually, let's, we're going to move the whole thing around. And, you know, I might have, as the producer, I might literally have had a draft edit where everything was slotted in the right place, and then on Wednesday night, we'd be like, okay, never mind, we're just going to re-edit the whole thing and rearrange it, and we'll do the whole script again, that's fine. And I think I loved that project. It's easily one of the hardest things I've ever worked on, but I loved it because we just had a lot of fun thinking about like, how are we going to tell this story and being really committed to it in a way where we were like, yeah, we can throw the whole thing out, that's fine. We'll just re-edit all the interviews, no problem. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you've raised something really interesting, which is that most people think the news is just like what's happening and how much it needs to be talked about. But obviously it is constructed in a hierarchy of stories mm. and you know, which is the most important story, how long will it get, the little bit of the story at the end, which used to be a kind of a fun piece. Um, and often those fun pieces actually were the things that maybe should have been told the most, who knows. Um, and so, as you say, podcasts can be much more subversive mm -hmm. because they can break with those traditions. Do you, going back to the conversation, I mean, do you take the zeitgeist, obviously, you know, the daily news mm -hmm. goes, okay, now we're doing Ukraine. We weren't, but now we are. Uh, or now we're doing the you know, cost of living crisis all of a sudden that's changed. And in fact, the optics around Ukraine are already more frightening because they're dropping down the news hits. And we, so we can see kind of, you know, the, the issue around um, fatigue, which is, which is nerve wracking. But do you, in the conversation, go, right, there's a lot of conversations happening at the moment, for example, about women's safety, violence against women, domestic violence, let's pick up the Amber Heard thing, and go, I'm gonna hone in and make a conversation about that. So do you think of yourself as having like topical responsibilities with regard to the conversation? Yeah, it's interesting. We're actually in the process of kind of really interrogating that question at the moment. Um, and we, we're a weekly, so we don't come out every day, which makes our decision making process different from a daily where you kind of, I think, probably feel a bit more like when there's a huge story, you have to cover it, where when you're a weekly, you don't. Um, you can choose your, your, your topics um, with more yeah, because of, because of the story, because of the people you've got. Um, but we're actually grappling with this question of kind of relevance and curiosity. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of kind of, uh, it's relevant, but also we want the listener to kind of be curious about it. 
um, and, and where they are is a, is a really interesting question because, you know, we don't particularly think our podcast is just listened to by people in the UK or the US. It's, it's kind of global. And I think that's an interesting thing for podcasts. You have to think about where people are and where they mm -hmm. listen and then what's relevant to them and what, what the news is to them at that moment. Um, and I was, just, I was reading a bit of this new Reuters digital um, news report that came out the other day and it was, it was fascinating saying, you know, that young, young people have a really different view of the news to, to kind of um, so the older people and they, they don't think, they don't, they're not interested in kind of political news but they're interested in maybe in climate news a bit more or in kind of social and cultural news and so there's, they might turn off if they're going to be getting this diet of Ukraine every day um, and yet, you know, but then, you know, the, the kind of the big broadcasters or kind of the, the papers, they kind of have, there is a beauty, I think, as a news um, outfit to do that. So it is a, it is a tension and a kind of the, the editorial decisions about where you put your efforts is, I mean, it takes a lot of brainstorming and a lot of conversations and that's kind of what you need to do as a producer. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the, I want to ask whether as news providers mm -hmm. you feel that you are part of an ethical discussion in your head or, or with your colleagues about the news in relationship to politics. So let's just say that politics is not just Westminster for a minute and it isn't just, you know, the kind of conventional political frameworks. Obviously, it is climate. It, it is um, cultural egalitarianism. It, it's lots of things. Do you feel that in order to keep people engaged with news that you need to let their relevance be acknowledged as relevance. So, if you like, the, the, you know, the Radio 1, Radio 4, you know, the Radio 4 kind of st stuff, the kind of central news, tends, as you say, to hit people 50 and above, um, and you, it reinforces the idea that, that, that what they care about is to be cared about, primarily. And that's quite a turn-off in terms of democracy with a small d as well as a big d so how much do you feel well no, we're here to kind of position other people as relevant to society because of their stories yeah i think definitely it's something that we're thinking about a lot so i'm currently working on um a news podcast that's going to be for young people and a big question we're grappling with is this idea of like okay do we do a westminster story but where can we find a young person angle or do we say that's not what they're interested in. Actually, we really want to centre the kind of news that they're interested in. And I think that's where the kind of explosion of news podcasts is really playing a role because you can feel like, yeah, if I want to go and listen to more traditional news, which is, you know, like you say, like your radio for you can, but I'm going to go and get my news from this. And I think also you're seeing a lot more news from people who aren't like traditional broadcasters who, you know, you might tune in because you're listening to two comedians because they really make you laugh but actually they talk about news stories and so you're getting your news but in a very different way to you know tuning in to radio four in the morning so you're obviously you're thinking about audiences because you want one but are you you seem to be saying we're also actually trying to pull audiences towards subjects in other words we're not kind of going what do the audience fancy hearing let's do it you're saying here are the things that are important to know about. How do we get people there? I think that's what we're debating at the moment is mm -hmm. do you say this is what the audience wants to listen to or do you say we think we should be doing this story? Do we do it like, you know, we find an angle on it that's interesting particularly to that or do you say actually we think this is what you should know, you know, and we're going to tell you about it. And I think the thing is that audiences can get more tailored news for them in lots of places. So you, if you decide actually we want to cover this because we think it's really important to know, you need to think about how you're going to do it because people will turn off and go and find the news they want to listen to elsewhere. So you were a woman's editor for a while mm. and obviously you know, we're sitting here as women uh, and we know that traditionally women's stories have been marginalised or told in unfortunate ways or, or deliberately um, malign ways. How significant is it for you to bring that woman's voice into this territory of podcasts? Uh, I think we're really fortunate. I mean, I, I don't mean to like boost the Guardian, but our team, just by way, by the fact that we, it's a feminist news organisation, like we have a lot of senior female editors, that it's so ingrained that it's, it's not something we consciously think about, but obviously when we're casting, when you're looking for guests, when you're looking for journalists and who's going to tell the story, you, you know, you're thinking about diversity, you're thinking, but, but not in a way that we're, we're discussing it with each other. It's just innate that we're not going to have three white blokes <laughs> explain a story on, on one episode. Like, you want a variety of voice. Um, 
And in terms of, you were talking about earlier about thinking about the audience, I think with Today in Focus, I think The Guardian, I don't know if, if senior management are particularly surprised by this, but it naturally draws a much younger audience. Like people, you know, it, we publish about 600 pieces a day. It's completely overwhelming. Like there's so much news and information. And if you have like 25, 30 minutes explaining one big story of the day, I can see that's quite appealing and quite easy to sort of digest and feel like you're still on, on top of things without having to be a complete uh, news junkie. So I think in terms of, yeah, a woman's voice, obviously it's important. I have a male co-host as well. Um, so do I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's not, I think we've got to a point at The Guardian where it, well, I'd hope that we're not ha consciously having to remind each other that we should do this and it should be, you know, a feminist take. Yeah, so it's sort of innately you has become. Yeah, so, the when, so when you then kind of look out from the, I won't call it a bubble, like that sounds derogatory, but you know, you, you look out from the space that you inhabit, which is big, you know, mm. and then you kind of look over and there you see Fox News over there and everything that's happening in the States at the moment, which will, of course, you know, flood this way and is already happening in other parts of, the, you know, Poland and Hungary and so on. Um, do you kind of think, well, at least, us, at least there's us doing our bit, or do you feel as if we are, our podcasts, if you like, our, our way of doing the news, the way that we want to tell stories is not not serving enough yet. I mean, do you think that we are in danger of getting in to be a marginalised group of I'm, aggressive thinkers? Well, uh, I'm told quite often that Today in Focus is the UK's number one current affairs podcast. So I, I go with that. I think that we have got Should. enough. We've got enough <laughs> listeners. I'm sure it's happening. And what Fox News gives us actually is really fantastic archive and tape and we want to like explain a story quickly and when their presenters are like and now a tornado has hit a uh, church and it's like right we've got that whereas you know you <laughs> to, to sort of explain things underneath but uh, you're right in terms of like politics like it's always been the way I think it's been like that with newspapers it's been like that with telly and I don't think podcasts are any different but I'm not yeah I don't feel particularly threatened if if that's the Question. Well, it, it wasn't so much being threatened as to whether or not, you know, I, I, I would guess that, you know, if you scratched all of us, we're all eager to make the world a better place. And so you try to use your life and your work for good purpose. And then every so often you think, oh, is the world, you know, getting better? Or is it, is it actually, you know, it, in other words, do you feel that collectively what we are all doing is making a difference? And that kind of makes you feel optimistic and positive. Of course, yeah, you hope so. I mean, you do episodes like we did one, two this week that I just found really draining. One was um, the Grenfell anniversary one. And of course, like, you know, you want to front and centre spotlight that tragedy, the people who are affected and make sure that that story is not being forgotten. It's still on the agenda. And then uh, one we did about the disappearance of one of our own journalists, Don Phillips and Bruno Pereira, who were murdered in the Amazon trying to, and their cause, I mean, how, there's no other way to have, um, see it apart from that they were really, really trying to make the world a better place. Yeah. They were fighting for indigenous rights. They got murdered for it. Um, and so, yeah, it's, you've got to believe in it. I mean, yeah. Otherwise, what's you, the point? Yeah, you've it? got to, you've got to believe that people are listening and that, you know, even if it's a smaller number of people than you'd like, that they, that they take something away from it. And I think that's actually something really interesting about um, podcasts, because when you, if you're a print journalist or you do an online news, you know, it's, it's some, you know, there's this whole kind of drive towards kind of, you know, clicks and, you know, maybe these many people have clicked my article and particularly news, you know, but, um, in audio, you can you can see like what well, percentage of people finish your podcast, and you can say, well, you know, this many hours and days of people have listened to what we've said, and that that means hopefully they will have taken away something. And if someone, even if someone has learned like two or three facts from half an hour of audio, and they go away and tell their friend about it, I think that's the, you know that's they pr they probably wouldn't necessarily do that from watching the ten o'clock news. I don't know because mm -hmm. they feel like you know, everyone knows that. But that's what I think a podcast can do. It can bring that backstory and that bit of humanity um, yeah. to the news. Well, you talked yourself about the way you learn 
and actually I learn in conversation. I mean, my most learning is always in chatting to people. Um, I mean, I can read, but, that, but it doesn't have the same impact normally as, as things that happen in my head when I'm talking to people. Mm. Um, and so that kind of human dimension and spontaneity, I mean, even though, even though you can edit the hell out of something, nevertheless, there's always something in somebody's voice and somebody's way of being that communicates. So I, I agree that the podcast like, moves into cracks and spaces that formal journalism often can't. But w w it just sort of staying with the idea of purpose as a podcast maker. Have you become more, uh, more of an activist since you started being a podcast? You might not, I mean, I'm, I'm using a word which you might not describe to yourself, but would you say that activism is something that you've been thinking about because of podcasting? Personally, no, because I do define myself as a journalist and I think there's, uh, and, and the conversation is kind of very neutral and tries to be and okay. is not, doesn't take a political line and, um, and I think a lot of news organisations, particularly in America actually, where you're not even allowed to, you're not allowed to be involved in any kind of political organisation, I think, if you're an American journalist. Um, I think it's a really interesting question though, how much journalists should be activists, but personally I'm, I'm not and maybe I should be more, but um, yeah, so sorry, no. <laughs> I don't know. You, you, you must have, you, you, well, all right, perhaps the word activist is, is, is not quite right, but you obviously sit somewhere on the spectrum of opinion between, you know, I'll just say anti progressive to progressive just for a want of a cliche for a minute, you know. Of You'll course. sit somewhere on that spectrum, won't you? I think, of course, yeah, obviously more progressive. Um, I, I think it does obviously influence your choices of story, and I think that's where it comes through. You yeah. know? How you present it. And how you present yeah. it, yeah, and the yeah. choices of people that you go to ask. So I, I guess I in that way, your, your activism is, is that. It's, and that these are all choices, every single thing in a news podcast, much more than, say, a panel podcast, is about a choice of how you tell yeah. something. I mean, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at, really, which is that this word neutral, <laughs> it's an illusion, isn't it, really? I mean, you, want, you, want, you try to be as fair as you can possibly be, bearing in mind your starting point is, I'm me. <laughs> yeah. And this is what I think about stuff. Oh, I have um, intense biases. I had to delete my Twitter when I took this job. I was like, can you just, can you just erase all your previous Twitter. opinions? Was that... A, a, no, not delete my but my old tweets. Because um, oh, oh, oh. I have too many opinions. Um, so they had to be like, tamper down a bit, but... Yeah, so obviously I know neutrality is a myth, but, you know, we try to be fair. And, but then at the same time, we're only going to cover stories that we're passionate about and mm -hmm. are interested in. So if that's the bias, then unfortunately there it is. Yeah, no, I, I don't think one should apologise for it because that's the multiplicity of views that need to be available. And I think often people begin podcasts because there's a gap where some view hasn't existed or a way of telling a story doesn't exist. Yeah, well, I think with... Politico, you know, obviously, like you said, like everyone kind of sits on a spectrum and we interview, I think, you know, we always tried in every episode that we did, I think, to really represent the, re the spectrum of opinion that you might find in Westminster on a particular subject. And, you know, some guests I was really delighted to meet and some would not be my first choice to meet. But I just, I think it's about making sure that when you're in that interview, you know, you don't show that, you give everyone a fair cop at, you know, what they're answering and you make sure that they're represented fairly in the show. And I think that's what made those podcasts so interesting is that, you know, you'd be hearing lots of different opinions all across a different range. Um, and yeah, I think that's, you know, as a producer, I find that I'm very conscious that I need to think about, like you said, you, at the very beginning of this talk, you want to be able to represent opinion, you know, to really give the full story. And so that's something that you really need to bear in mind. And I think it's really important to check what your own opinions are. And I think that's where having a team around you is really helpful because actually, you know, they can be there to say, well, actually, I think we need to ask them this or that. Um, and so, yeah, having like an exec or having a conversation with your presenter about how you kind of navigate that is really important, I think. I I'm going to come to the audience uh, in a minute. I just want to ask uh, one more question, really, which is about when you look out on the landscape of podcasts, or maybe you don't, but I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a sort of an arts nerd, so I'd like to look out and everything. And uh, so next week I'm in Rwanda for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings. And one of the things that we're not, not that I'm a Commonwealth head of government, but I'll be going there to talk about women and violence. And then the week after, I'm in Sierra Leone doing a, a WOW festival. And so you go to, you know, to say, the African continent or you know, across the places in the Middle East, and you see you know, the global majority 
having incredibly co big conversations with lots of very young people um, from a completely different worldview, inevitably, than from where we sit. So how much do you... I know you're, you're mainly UK, but obviously you have a, a global reach, all of you. How much do you look at what's happening in other parts of the world and what other podcasters are urging us to understand and go, we need to, kind of, we need to understand that and pull it back into us? How much does that happen? Um, well, first, it's because it's, it's a daily news podcast and, you know, we're a global organisation anyway. If it's a big story of the day, then it, that's the one we're going to cover. You know, if it was... For instance, the school shootings in the US, yes, we did that. We're doing climate change stories uh, across the globe, like India's heat wave, a lot of UK politics. It's, it's, I mean, the mix is pretty broad, and it's always, yeah, it's led by the fact that we have this stable of journalists and, you know, a newspaper and a site and all the rest of it, so that, we, you know, we get to pick and cherry-pick the stories that we want to tell. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's a global audience, so there's a generally... I'd say 65, 35 mix of UK to international. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's really interesting. You know, you're talking about how you have like a sort of stable of journalists. I felt like when I worked at The Economist, one of the things that really helped when we were trying to tell international stories is that they had journalists across the world. And yeah, it's not perfect because obviously a lot of them had moved there. You know, maybe they weren't born there, but it was great to have a voice of someone who was living there, understood it more than, you know, just someone who was reporting on it from the UK, had never been to that place. And so I think it comes back to this authenticity question where it's important to tell these stories, but I think you need to think about how you tell them. Um, like having journalists out there was great because they could go out to events and meet people and record with them and get tape, and that was all amazing. And I think thinking about it that way so you don't just feel like you're reporting from very far away um, is a really important part of that. I, I think the landscape of podcasting, if you look at the news podcasting landscape, it's been driven by kind of the New York Times, The Guardian... Um, and then some of the bigger broadcasters who are doing daily shows, you know, like Sky or um, the BBC's newscasters, which is obviously one of the biggest broadcasters in the UK. Um, and then, you know, the whole spectrum of daily shows in the US. But there's clearly, there's, I mean, let's be honest, it takes a lot of resources to make a daily news podcast. Yeah, yeah. And so in, in countries like, say, Rwanda, um, I think South Africa probably has quite a developed um, daily or at least weekly news podcast ecosystem. But I think in, it's about the media ecosystem in those places as well. If you haven't got kind of um, the, the money to invest in a daily show, it's, it's not going to be there. But hopefully in the future that will happen because those, every audience everywhere um, needs, I think, this kind of, kind of different way of telling or hearing the news. So mm -hmm. hopefully in 10 years, 15 years, then there will be you know, a daily news podcast from Rwanda and I'm sorry if there already is I just haven't heard it although I should go and look for it actually <laughs> you can go and look yeah but I was also very aware you know when, when Hong Kong started to move towards a place of you know repression and obviously many other parts of the world you cannot rely on the mainstream news um, because it's controlled so you're then incredibly reliant on people having the tenacity and the wherewithal to create alternative news sources um, and to get them out. And that, that's a kind of uh, sort of connected tissues that I'm just wondering, are, are you, are you, do you relate to those people? Do you sort of seek them out and find them? I think it's really important. I think a lot of my work is very UK-focused. Um, but I think you, know, you raise a really interesting point, which is that, you know, there are big broadcasters doing news podcasting, but that doesn't mean that only big broadcasters are doing news podcasting. And actually, there is a lot of space for other people who are like, I'm going to take it upon myself to actually deliver what I see as the news. And it goes back to this whole thing that we've been talking about in terms of serving your audience so that there's a space where, you know, people can't get what they need from traditional news and instead they seek out where they can find their news from elsewhere. They'll, they'll make their own. Yeah. Well, look, you're all here at 10.30 on a Saturday morning, so you probably have got some views on all of this. <laughs> and you can ask, uh, if you want to put the lights up a bit more so that we can see everybody. Um, and obviously you can ask anything from philosophical to technical. <laughs> anything if you could wait for a mic to arrive. And, and can I leave it to you to give out the mic to whoever you see fit? Hi, uh, thank you so much for that really interesting conversation. It's great to be back in a physical space as well, so thank you. Um, my question to Roisin and Gemma, and then opening it out to Ellie, um, obviously you have this traditional print 
background? What benefits do you think that's brought to podcasting? And bringing in Ellie, do you think we're looking at a future where maybe journalists specifically train for podcasting rather than working across print and podcasting? Yeah, I mean, I've never worked in print, ever. I decided I want to work in radio, and that's how I got my start. So I think um, I love working with print journalists because I think there's a really amazing way of writing that comes from working in that kind of space. Um, but I like to think that working in audio means that I come very much with an audio head. Like, I haven't really spoken about it in this conversation, but my massive thing is that I love archive, sound, music how you have that news story, what you do with it to make it really interesting and appealing and kind of make it entertaining as well as really informative. And I think having a team where you have someone with a print background and then someone who's really got an audio head is like an amazing combination. And that's why I'm sure that your work is all really great because you're able to pull those things together. Um, but it's to say that if you want to work in audio, you don't have to have ever been in a print newsroom because I never have been. <laughs> Uh, I would say to that, I'm very grateful for our producers who are like Ellie and have complete audio heads. Because <laughs> um, as a print person, I come to it with narrative, structure, what are the right questions, how do you edit this down to the finest thing? And often, and I still sometimes write a bit too printy and I'm told, bring it back to your voice. Um, it's like, this, this is my voice. Uh, no, it's um, it, all the things I've been taught about journalism, and it's just because I came from that way. Um, and now I'm learning to appreciate archive and, and how little bits of sound design can do you a favor in telling the story rather than you trying to hammer it uh, through your words <laughs> to the listener. Um, yeah, and also, by the way, this is probably not the forum, but we are going to be looking for freelance producers uh, later in the <laughs> summer. So if you are up for doing that, then uh, get in touch. Yeah, I mean, I'd just echo uh, what you said there. Um, it, just like about that narrative and perhaps about editing yourself a bit. Um, which you do a lot in print. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe scripting, but then, you know, you have to script in audio as well. So, um, I mean, I guess it, it's, it's about journalistic practice. Like if, you, if you're a journalist in print, it, it, you have to learn the new tricks of the trade, but you can translate that into audio. So. Thank you very much. This has been really interesting. I feel that I'm quite old to this. I was on the BBC uh, training course, and this is very new for me because I used to be a BBC Radio 4 documentaries producer and presenter. And what's interesting for me is some of my best documentaries were within a documentary that I was making was a reveal within it, and then I would develop that into a new narrative and a new strand and a new documentary for Radio 4. How much flexibility do podcasts have at creating and discovering something within an already existing documentary to create a new narrative and to create a new documentary? And a second question, which I feel is something that's on my mind for a long time, you're trying to create news for a new audience. And I feel the people that are bringing news to young people, I've got two young daughters, where they, where I would traditionally listen to Radio 4 and Today program, they follow influencers. And the role of influencers within podcasts is, and, and the news is something that I find astounding because what is their pedigree? I'm a Today program person and Radio 4 person. So this has been a new experience for me, especially having daughters of 19 and 21. So I would like to know I've always rammed Radio 4 down to them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just interesting to find out about new narratives and about the role of influencers. Yeah, and can I just ask, when you say you're on a BBC training course, you mean you're on a new breed of BBC training course? No, no, I'm old. <laughs> well, I, I was on the original <laughs> that's a BBC statement. I was on the original BBC training course many years ago, the one that, you know, oh, I, I you killed you, myself to get onto. I and you then you worked at Radio one. 4 for many <laughs> years. So, um, I'm just interested in what, what you know. Okay. Those two points. Who wants Thank to pick you. up that? 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this question is really interesting because I got my start at Whistledown, so making a lot of Radio 4 documentaries. First thing I ever made was a Radio 4 documentary. And now I'm working for Persifonica, which um, is really thinking about new and emerging talent. Um, so I guess to, to both your points, the first point about can you pull out strands of ideas, like, yes, definitely. I feel like at The Economist, we were constantly making shows and being like, that's really interesting, and then we might come back for like a special. And that's what I loved is that because there's no kind of set way of doing things. People are like, okay, in you know, a month's time, we're going to do this big special, and the entire episode is going to be dedicated to this really cool thing that we discovered randomly while talking to an academic one day about something else. Um, and then just on your second point about influencers, I think people are turning to other kind of hosts and things for their news now. Like, I think that's definitely a trend. I think it's coming from, if you look at the whole of the podcasting landscape, not just news for a moment, I think big name talent is a really big trend at the moment and when I'm talking to different companies about pitching it's always like and who have you got to host who got? who's the talent how many followers do they have what are they going to bring what audience are they going to bring like I think if you want to work in it that is something you have to get used to it's slightly different in news and I actually think this comes from the big broadcasters because you have so many big broadcasters that have you know a big podcast where they might have like rotating hosts but you don't have like a specific person and so I think it's you, this, this is still a space where you can have not a big name. You know, you actually you might have a journalist from within the organisation. Um, but in terms of your question around, you know, maybe you have a presenter who hasn't gone to do a journalism course or, you know, is just interested. I think I understand where you might come from, where you're worried about that. But I think it's about having... If they have a team behind them where you have a producer and actually you're working on it. And I think if, as we've been talking about on the stage, it's all about giving kind of a fair go to the story then I don't necessarily have a problem with it. I don't need them to be, you know, BJTC accredited to be a host on the show. I just think they need to be passionate to be able to tell the story. I think they need to be interesting. And um, I think as long as the show is done where you can, you can hear if, you know, the kind of legwork has been done to kind of do it properly. Um, and I think that is where a lot of people are getting their news from now. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a big part of what the landscape is going to look like going forward. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, the kind of idea of the influencers and the pedigree and, and so on. I'm what, sure my biases. I, on. It does make me feel queasy. It, I mean, I know that is the future, but it does make me feel a bit... Oh, I've spent, like, I don't know, wanted to be a journalist since I was five. I done the importance of it and, you know... It's... It's like my niece saying to me recently that she wants to be a journalist too, like me, but only as a hobby, because she's also going to be doing interior design and all the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, and yeah, I think it, it shows my age. It just makes me feel a bit queasy, to be honest, but I, I need to get on board. I mean, I'm someone who, I don't, I'm so off socials now, um, so maybe that's why. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, queasiness is a good feeling sometimes because it does kind of make you go well you know because uh, queasy doesn't yeah, mean you I gonna, mean, aren't going to do it does it we've already got a shift in a lot of and, and it's, it's quite mainstream now people are saying i don't trust the mainstream news or this is fake yeah. news we're already in a very problematic space yeah. with how people trust the media which yeah. media they're going to you know who they believe and who they don't you know you've got elections being won by whatsapp and yeah. all the rest of it so it's we're in really bizarre nebulous territory now where a lot of people are very media savvy but at the same time I would say pretty media gullible as well like believing this YouTube versus I don't know CNN because you know alternative news rules at the moment but yeah. and do you have a, 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 an experience of influencers who you thought were very flaky who because they realized how much influence they have they kind of start reading researching talking in other words they become experts there, um, Eventually. there is one particular person during the COVID pandemic that I was really infuriated by, and my own, one of my best friends became, I would say, radicalised by this person, um, and caused a big falling out. But you know, she was a total like anti-vaxxer. COVID is a myth. It's all being made up by the government. I'm interviewing experts. I've got this person who used to work on vaccines on her thing, and it was, and it was a real eye opener. But at the same time, I couldn't. I wasn't able to report it because then we also had the problem of like, well, if we're going to, are we going to give this person the oxygen, basically, as a news organisation? So yeah, I have, I have a lot of reservations about it, but I'm assuming that doesn't kind of enter into your yeah. World no, but I think much. it's a really interesting bit. We kind of touched on it earlier about you know how do you tell it and if why do why do younger people like the influencers? Is because they feel a connection with them? Um, it's because um, 
their personality comes through perhaps in the way they talk. And there is that question of how much news shows should do that. So you take a show like Newscast, for example, it's quite chatty, isn't it? You know quite a lot about the presenters. Um, it's a, still a BBC product, but it's quite kind of informal. And there is, you know, maybe, and there are other shows like that. So the, um, the forecast that they talk, um, the, the presenter of that, whose name I've um, temporarily forgotten, um, but uh, they talk quite kind of openly about themselves and it's quite chatty in quite a different way, say, from kind of Michael Barbaro on the New York Times or, or, or you and mm -hmm. um, Michael on, on, um, uh, on Today in Focus. So maybe there, is, maybe there are some shows that will do that. Maybe they'll be a bit more like the personality of the host might come through a bit more and then you take a journey with that host as they learn. Um, I don't know, maybe that's, that's part of it perhaps. But hopefully the influencers do have, as Ellie said, like a really good team behind them and who are journalists as well because then, they need to. you know, they, you, you, it is really dangerous territory. <laughs> yeah. Anybody got a different view on any of that? Before we just ask another question? Yeah? No, it's right. You were asked for another question. I just wanted to check whether anybody had anything burning to say on influencers. <laughs> anybody here an influencer? I know that's what I was going to say. Anybody? Probably... Who is an influencer? Anybody? I don't know when you get the influencer badge, actually. I'm not yeah, sure. What point? What point are you <laughs> at what point do you become an influencer? Free stuff starts I'm one. one. You're one, aren't you? We're, we're influencers. Yeah. So, next question. Um, this has been super useful as somebody that is starting a very, very indie, very, very niche news podcast. Um, but one of the things that I'm wondering that you touched on a little bit is in terms of the uh, choosing the stories that you do and um, how you're covering them. Where do you get the insights as to what's working and what's not working? Is it just on download numbers or do you look across different areas to get that? I'd say it, it shouldn't just be downloads. I, that's the, obviously the thing to, to, that you're drawn towards. Um, but I think share, sharing is quite interesting, like where, who pe where people share it. Um, it's really hard sometimes to measure that and track it. Um, also, completion rates, um, which you can tell on Apple Connect um, and a bit on Spotify. It depends on which platforms you're on. Um, uh, but yeah, I think if you're, if you're just chasing downloads, you might be disappointed at first. But if you, if you can build a conversation around your show and, and people share it and they're interested in it, then, then I, I would build, build your kind of audience that way. Um, don't, just, yeah, don't just look at the download numbers. Um. I don't look at the analytics at all. We have very sophisticated metrics at The Guardian to analyze like how long, it, like all of it, but um, I deliberately don't check because uh, <laughs> I feel like it would be too like soul destroying or, or you know, whatever. But um, I generally think it, I, there's like a split of 33 for you in terms of stories that you do, 33 because it is just the news agenda and 33 what, you know, this, this is what the podcast is doing, we're going to take this story that didn't get enough play in the paper, but actually is really interesting and tell it in a really rich sort of 3D way. Um, but I think generally that's the balance, but you know, the, there's so much to pick from. Mm. Um, so for us it's, it's yeah. There's not that much, you know, is this, is this going to connect with listeners? It's more like, is this a great story? Can it, can, because, you know, sometimes great print stories don't work in audio. Like, can this be told in an, in an interesting way? So it's more that. Yeah, I think both of you have really made excellent points that you, I think, first of all, make something that you're proud of. That's like half the battle. Like, you want to be able to defend it. Um, like, yeah, I think you can get yourself in a bit of a tears if you look at the numbers. But I would say that completion rates are actually really helpful. Like, on Politico, we made a type of episode where we'd kind of go out and meet an MP, but we did it kind of via Zoom and, you know, it was interesting to see like how many people kind of got to the end of that and then it kind of helped you to, you know, we sort of thought people weren't listening the whole way through. So actually we changed up the way that we did it because we used to do two MPs and we were like, actually people aren't listening to the second half. So we're just going to do one and you hear their story the whole way through. Um, so I think things, little clues like that can really help you. And then I really think like chatting to people about it helps. So there are loads of like forums online and stuff if you want to get um, help from like the podcasting community where you can say people just have a listen tell me kind of what you think and I think that's really useful feedback and people might give you ideas that you've not heard about before and really helps build that community I think between different podcasts yeah you can't just as a final thing on that you can't chase the numbers really because sometimes something will be a huge hit and you won't be able to be able to understand why mm. so and you can't necessarily replicate that as long as you really believe in it and you're interested and your the episode shows that everyone who's making it is interested in this then 
that's that's the the main bar I think. So I mean we, we have to finish but I just wanted to really press home this idea about vocation and passion and belief because all of you I mean you're you're going this afternoon to do some uh, scholarship around yeah, young no. emerging journalists yeah right you know it, it's you were going to go to Berlin but you're not now but you, but, you know, but nevertheless, you know, you're here on a Saturday morning to carry on talking about journalism, the importance of the story, et cetera, et cetera, as are you. And I think that's you know, a really important thing to say, which is that, you know, podcasts are sort of current and can be cast as sort of fashionable. But underneath that, really, is just one more urgency about the fact that we really believe in telling stories, we really believe in probably people who don't get a chance to tell the story well enough being given the vehicle for it, and everybody's trying to do that as well as they possibly can. Uh, and I think it's amazing to have this new sort of way of playing with narratives. And I mean, you, you're a bit of a kind of, um, I wouldn't say imposter syndrome, but you sort of said, well, I didn't really know. But actually, it is really important to have people with strong, ethics to journalism which you have got also be fronting up mm. and being a voice that people can trust because you, you know because in the end it is actually about trust as well as professionalism and it's also about kind of b being part of a tribe of people who you know who want to help other people ha have a story be heard so you're all here at 10 30 on Saturday morning as well so presumably you're all kind of stuck into like really caring about life <laughs> Um, <laughs> otherwise you'd be in the sun in a deck chair, wouldn't you? <laughs> Which you're allowed to do as well. Okay. So listen, we've come to the end of this session. Can I thank very much the, the great contributors here and, and you as well. And um, go and get yourself a cup of tea or whatever else happens next and uh, see you at the next session. Bye. Thanks.